Hello everybody, Mr. Eck here, and I'd like to talk to you today about a topic that I find both important and interesting, and that is the difference quotient. So here is an example of what a difference quotient problem might look like when you see it on your homework. We're going to solve this problem, and then we're going to talk about what it means. So we're going to do things a little bit backwards, but I will explain why we're doing this. I just think we should do the algebra first this time. Um, so the problem says compute and simplify the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And so the words difference quotient almost always refer to an equation of this form. And this form is always going to be the same. It's never going to change. The thing that is going to change in every problem is the function that they ask you to compute this for. So today we're going to compute this for the function x squared minus 2x. Um, before I bring this all into a fraction, let's think about what all of these pieces are. Um, f of x is just the equation x squared minus 2x. That's given to us. But f of x plus h, at least in isolation, says plug in x plus h for every x in the equation. Plug in x plus h. So if I were to, I'm going to compute this separately, and you can start, once you're, you're kind of practiced with these, you can compute them within the fraction, but I'm going to compute it separately for now. f of x plus h would be, well, f of x is x squared minus 2x. So f of x plus h would be quantity x plus h squared minus 2 quantity x plus h. And then often or always, uh, no often, you will need to simplify the f of x plus h expression. So in this case, x plus h quantity squared turns into x squared plus 2x h plus h squared. Um, why is that true? Well, actually, why don't I do that out uh, longhand? x plus h squared is x plus h times x plus h. And then there's this minus 2x plus h over in the end. And when you multiply this out, the first terms go to the first terms, the second terms go to the second terms, and everything is multiplied with everything else. And so you get x squared plus xh plus hx plus h squared. It's the perfect square pattern. You're actually really familiar with it, but it gets, it gets confusing with the h's. And then I would have minus 2x minus 2h. I'm going to distribute that minus 2 since it feels like we're distributing in this step as well. Um, then we'd combine all the like terms. So it would be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 2x minus 2h. And that, this whole thing is just the f of x plus h part of the difference quotient. So that's really just this piece. Okay, so I've computed this piece. I know what f of x is, and h is just a variable. H is just a variable letter. So I'm now prepared, though, to plug in into the difference quotient formula uh, these things that ooh, these things that I've found. So let's make some space. Um, so f of x plus h minus f of x all over h would be, if I plug in these terms, we'll do the f of x plus h first. Uh, I'll do that in red is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 2x minus 2h. Then I have to subtract f of x. So when I subtract f of x, what I have to remember is that f of x should be in parentheses, right? I'm subtracting the entire thing. So I'm going to subtract in parens x squared minus 2x. And then I'm going to put that just all over h. And we're not going to do anything with the h so far. Now I'm going to simplify all of these terms. Um, the first thing I'm going to actually do is make a second copy of this and distribute that negative uh, on the x squared minus 2x. So this is going to become minus x squared plus 2x. Now that all the parentheses on the top numerator are kind of dealt with, you can come in with your canceling pen. Let's cancel in purple today, I don't know, for fun. 
and start looking for things that are going to add or subtract with each other. So x squared, I have a plus x squared in the front and a minus x squared in the back. And I have a minus 2x right here and I have a plus 2x right here. And almost all the time, what usually happens is that everything in that second term that you put in there is going to cancel with something in the first term. Once you've done that, you can now rewrite it with just anything that remains. So it would be 2xh plus h squared minus 2h all over h. Well, this is pretty nice. Uh, I see that I have a lot of h's in common, and in particular in the numerator, I have a common factor of h in every single term. And so I notice that if I pull out an h from the numerator, uh, it would be h times 2x plus h minus 2. And then that's still divided by h. So now those h's are going to reduce out to 1, right? That's 1, 1. And we actually get our final answer. Uh, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. The difference quotient simplifies to the formula 2x plus h minus 2. Uh, and sometimes you'll see this in calculus written uh, with the h at the end, 2x minus 2 plus h. But either way is fine. And so this is the difference quotient for the function... Uh, f of x equals x squared minus 2x. I'm just pausing for a second. Here's all the work on one page. Um, I did do this kind of scratch work at the start, but by the time that you're really experienced with these, you will probably be able to start on this kind of middle step where you just keep yourself within the fraction. And the biggest error that I see almost always, I mentioned it before, is forgetting to distribute the negative correctly on that last term. If you forget to distribute that negative, then a lot of like less stuff cancels out here correctly. And because stuff didn't cancel out here correctly, the H's don't cancel out correctly. And you get a big old mess in the final answer. So it's really important to just be careful in every step because these are designed to simplify, but only and really, really only if every step is done correctly. So what in the world does this strange equation or, or expression f of x plus h minus f of x all over h even mean? Why do we care about it? What is it good for? This is the next couple minutes of the video. And I will say for pre-calculus student, although the next little bit is interesting, you don't need to know it. You're going to learn this. You're going to need this in calculus. You're going to learn this in calculus and you're going to use it all the time. For us in pre-calc, it's just interesting extra. But that said, I love to talk about interesting extra things, so we're going to talk about it. You may remember from pre- or I would say, uh, excuse me, that this difference quotient is an average rate of change machine. Huh? Let me explain. Um, an average rate of change, of course, involved, and I call this the old way for computing an average rate of change, involved picking two x values, maybe x1 right here, and uh, where should we do it to? Maybe an x2 right here. And then the x1 had a y value that we called the y value f of x1, which you could think about as being like y1. And the x2, I'll do that in blue, had a y value that we could think about as f of x2, aka like y2. And then the average rate of change was the slope of the secant line connecting them. Oh, that was rainbow for a second there. The average rate of change was the slope of the secant line. And we had a formula, which was because it was a slope, the formula for average rate of change was always f of x2 minus fx1, f of x1, over x2 minus x1. And the reason that formula existed was because it was essentially a reformulation of the slope formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. 
So that was how you'd compute average rates of change. And if I remember right in Algebra 2 or Math 3 or whatever you call that class, you spent a lot of time computing average rates of change by hand, but you had to, every time you had to do it, you had to go to the equation, you had to either read the values from the graphs, or you had to compute the values from the equation. And then you had to plug them all into this, and it got really tedious. And so mathematicians were doing this as well, like not in Algebra 2 class, but way back when. And they said, I wonder if we could do this more efficiently. Because what makes this really inconvenient is the fact that we have two x's. We have this x2, and we also have this x1. And so we kind of have two independent variables. And we have to artisanally pick them every time. So here's the same graph. And I want to introduce average rate of change in a new way. Let us say on our new graph that we still have an x1. I'm just going to call it though x because I don't, I no longer need, I'm not going to have two x's. So I'm just going to call it x. And I still have this value f of x. And then instead of picking an x2 over there to the right, instead of what I'm going to do is select a distance and call this distance h. So you can think about the h in the difference quotient as representing the distance between x1 and x2. And so at the end of h, I will put another mark and call this, well, if you're at x and then you go h units more, you're at x plus h on the x-axis. And so this would be like, what we would call, I'm going to write old x2. This is what x2 used to be called, but we're now calling this x plus h instead. And then above x, the x value of x plus h, we of course had a point, and we used to call this the y2, or um, yeah, we used to call this the y2, we're not going to call it y2 anymore. We're going to call this value f of x plus h. So to derive the, the slope then of this line, uh, or to compute the average rate of change, sorry, which does involve finding the slope of this line. So I'm going to find the slope of that. What do I have to do? Well. I, the slope formula is x2, no, it's not, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But wait, I'm not using any of those terms, so I'm going to substitute in. It's really going to be, well, the y2 was f of x plus h. The y1 was really f of x. And then on the bottom, my x2 was not x2, but it was x plus h. And my x1 was just x. And now a magical thing happens. And this is part of why this is so useful, is that I now simplify the bottom. x and minus x reduce out. And I get f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And what this is, even though this is that difference quotient formula, is it's just another way of talking about a slope. That's where this formula comes from. And if you think about, uh, the way to think about the variables within it is that x is just an x in space. And h is a, a distance between from x until you get to the next x. So you can think about that h as being a distance in space. Um, and I guess we said, you know, like, ah, oh, you still have two variables, right? I said we had two independent variables before. Uh, but what's nice now, at least, is that x is still x, and h is kind of related to x in a way that in the old graph, which I did, oh, sorry, I got rid of the graph. In the old graph, the x2 wasn't really related to x at all, um, but x plus h is related to x. All right, so I'm calling this example 1b because it's the same function as we did at the very start of the video. At the start of the video, we discovered that the difference quotient 
is 2x plus h minus 2 for uh, that f of x, uh, which f of x right here. But say that I wanted to compute the average rate of change between x equals negative 1, which would be uh, over here, and x equals 2, which would be right here for f of x. Uh, I would be computing basically the slope of the secant line, and I can show you what you'd have to do before. You'd have to do f of um, 2 minus f of negative 1 all over 2 minus minus 1, and you'd simplify it out. And just simplifying it out uh, off screen, f of 2 is 0, f of negative 1 is, uh, comes out to negative 3. This is just plugging in the numbers into the uh, expression. Um, sorry, f of 2 is, f of negative 1 is 3, and I'm subtracting it. And so I have negative 3 over 3, or negative 1, which is the slope of this line. Now, of course, that wasn't that hard, but I also chose easy numbers for you. Like, right, what if this was saying uh, 20, and this was negative 10? All of a sudden, you have a much harder time. So, but let's look at the difference quotient way. Um, so the difference quotient, I would need to decide on an x, and I'm going to let my x equal negative 1. And then based on that x, I need to look at how far apart my x2 is. And I notice that it's 3 units apart, so h will be 3. And then instead of doing this fraction, I basically already did the fraction. I did the work ahead of time. Of doing the fraction and simplifying it. So now all I need to plug in is the x value, 2 times minus 1, plus the h value, 3 minus 2. No fractions, no nothing. Um, so 2 times minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So that's going to be minus 2 plus 3 minus 2 again. What do I get? Negative 1. And so in this case, of course, it's kind of simple. But can you imagine if I had changed the numbers to be negative 10 and 20? You, the person that's going all the way back to the equation and plugging in a bunch of icky, sticky numbers, are going to have a way harder time than me that I've already done the simplifying. So I would just need to plug in. I need to find my new h value and plug it in. And then I could be done about three times as fast as you. Now, example 1c, again, I'm using the same function. I'm going to show you why we use this in calculus. This is some pre-calculus content right here. Using So uh, the problem would say something like this. Using two points that are 0 0.001 units apart, right? So we can do an average rate of change between points that are far apart, or more importantly, probably points that are close together. Using that distance, you can estimate the instantaneous rate of change at any x value. And I'm deciding on x equals 3. So basically, what we are trying to do is go put a point at x equals 3. That's our x1. And then we're trying to make an x2 that is 3.0001. I maybe have an extra 0 here. 3.0001 and then compute the slope between those two points. Look at how irritating this would be if I had to do it by hand. I would have to do f of 3.00, oh, I did have a zero, extra zero, minus f of 3 all over 3.001 minus 3. And this is making me reach for my calculator. Uh, by the way, if I, I'll, I have, think I have another video on how to do this in your calculator, but the real quick answer is put the equation for f of x into your y1, hit enter, and then once you have that in your, your uh, y equals, you can go back to your home screen, enter the formula just as you've written it on the page, uh, and I, the other video or instructions can show you where to get that y1. Hit enter, you get a value, that, and it tells you the value of 4.001. Uh, I guess that was equal to 4.001. But you had to either go to your calculator or compute a whole bunch of annoying decimals. Now let me show you my way. I'm going to go back to the graph, and I'm going to say, well, guess what? Let my x be equal to 3, and I want to go a little bit past 3. This is not to scale. So I'm going to let my distance to the next x be h equals 0 0.001. That is, 
my h can be a very small number. So if x is 3, my h is 0 0.001, I'm going to be calculating the same thing, except, like I said, I already did the fraction work ahead of time. So to find this, all I need to do is 2 times 3 plus 0 0.001 minus 2. Oh, that's 6.001 minus 2 is 4.001. And this is why we use these in calculus, is you can actually compute an instantaneous rate of change or estimate an instantaneous rate of change for any x and also for any h. You can think about the h as almost like your, your engineering tolerance, how far away you want your points to be. So say you want a more precise estimation, then you can just make h smaller. So we'll say make h smaller for more precision. You can't do that. Just make the h smaller if you have to go back and recalculate the dang darn thing every time. And I want to prove something else to you, or maybe not prove, but I want to show something else to you. We are saying that the slope of the tangent line and the slope of this line kind of right here should be 4 ish we'll say m is approximately four that's our evidence i went and graphed this on desmos um, and it's not really a proof because i i knew the answer uh, but you can see that if you do graph the tangent line you can see what that line would look like on a computer you can count its slope over it's over one and up four so that tangent line really does have slope four and the best way to compute that instantaneous rate of change slope, I think, is by using that difference quotient. Thank you guys for enjoying that little diversion, 15-minute diversion, on what the difference quotient means. I hope it helps you understand why we're calculating these things. It can also help you check your answers, and we're going to see that on this problem as well. Um, but when we do these and we're just calculating them, we're not thinking about slope usually. We're just doing the problem. So here is a problem. Evaluate and simplify the difference quotient for now a new function. f of x is equal to 3x minus 5. So in this case, I'm going to go straight into the fraction. And I'm going to say, all right, so this would be f of x plus h, which would just be uh, this function with x plus h plugged in every for every x. So it would be 3 parentheses x plus h minus 5. And then it would be minus f of x. So I'm going to subtract the equation for f of x, so minus parentheses 3x minus 5. And then the equation says put that all over h, the variable. Now we'll do a little simplifying. So I'll distribute the 3. So we'll get 3x plus 3h minus 5 for the first part. And I'll distribute the negative here, so a minus 3x and plus 5 for the second part, still all divided by h. And then I'll get out my canceling pen. Uh, I have a 3x and a minus 3x, and a 5 and a minus 5. And so in this case, I see that this simplifies down to 3h divided by h. And in the previous one, this is where we had to kind of factor out an h. Uh, but here I notice that it's just going to reduce out, and we just get 3. So it actually turns out that the difference quotient for this does simplify to 3. Not 3x, not 3h, just the number 3. And why might that be? Well, let's think about what this graph is. This is a line with slope 3. So any rate of change is always equal to oh the number three so that's how i said like this can be useful for checking your answers um, we know the difference quotient helps us identify rates of change lines have a constant rate of change and actually we just proved that this is a line with a constant rate of change and it's kind of a useful piece of information um, so it can sim sometimes these will simplify really really nicely so for the rest of the video, we are just going to do a couple more examples of difference quotients that you might see on your homework. 
but we kind of have a, attacked everything that we really need to attack. So I would say that this is probably a good place for you to stop and go and attempt the problems. And then once you get stuck, if you get stuck, return to this video, find the problem that looks like what you're stuck on and use that for assistance. Now, if you're still feeling a little unsure about everything and you just want to see some more examples, then please stick around. We are going to do those examples right now. So here's a difference quotient that has a negative. Uh, we have f of x is equal to negative 2x squared. So again, I'm going to compute the difference quotient. I'm first going to compute f of x plus h. So that would be negative 2 parentheses x plus h quantity squared. Uh, then I'll do my, um, the minus f of x part. So that's going to be minus negative 2x squared. Uh, and then that would be all over h. Uh, I recognize the x plus h squared from, and I did the work right at the start of the video, that's going to be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So I'm going to write that with the negative 2. So it's going to be negative, let me write this, write it like this. So it's going to be negative 2 x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Um, and then I am going to distribute this negative at this time. So it'll be plus 2x squared. Still all over h. Now let me bring the negative 2 across to each of the three terms in the uh, x plus h. So it'll be minus 2x squared minus 4xh minus 2h squared plus 2x squared from the uh, tail before. And then this is all over h still. Hopefully something cancels. Ah, it looks like the 2x squared terms, x squared terms will now cancel. So this is going to simplify to, trying to keep it all on one screen here. We'll go down here. Negative 4xh minus 2h squared all over h. The h can pull out, so this is going to be h times negative 4x minus 2h divided by h, and I will get those h's will reduce to 1, 1, 1, so we get negative 4x minus 2h for that difference quotient. Not so bad. Um, it's simple. Everything simplified out nicely. We didn't have a lot of terms, but you really do have to be careful when you multiply out your x plus h and be especially careful with all of those negatives in that problem. Because if you can imagine just one of those negatives goes wrong, all of a sudden the canceling doesn't work. And then this canceling also doesn't work. And so we end up in a, in a sad place. But if you work, if it works out, then we get this nice expression uh, that could tell us again, what does this tell us? It kind of is a way of us understanding the slope, the average rate of change uh, at given x values. So, um, you know, if you wanted to find the average rates of change for a parabola, which is what this is a graph of, here it is a little closer, um, you could use the formula negative 4x minus 2h. Now we're going to get a little trickier. Um, we're going to do a problem that I actually saw on the homework way back in section P6, um, or at least a, a something similar, and a lot of students asked about it then but we hadn't really learned about difference quotients. So we're now going to try it again. Uh, we're going to look at the function f of x is equal to 1 over x, which by the way, if you've never seen this graph, here it is. It's really cool. It's one of the neatest graphs that we get to play with this year. 1 over x, of course, is like a fraction. So as x gets bigger, 1 over x gets smaller. And if x is negative, then the y values are negative on the other side, but it has that same feature that as x gets larger, 1 over x gets smaller. As x gets smaller, 1 over x gets larger, and it has this bending property. It's also undefined at 0, which is why in the graph you notice that it literally does not cross that line of 0. It has a break right there. Now again, we don't really care about any of that. We just care about the algebra. So in this case, I am going to set up the difference quotient all in one big complex fraction. So I'm going to call, so we're going to do the first part, which is f of x plus h. We'll do that in red. That would just be 1 over the quantity x plus h. 
and then I have to do minus f of x. So that would be minus 1 over x. And then this is all over h. And then because I've got like a, this triple fraction, I'm going to write this as h over 1 just to, to keep my fractions nice. The, I think the best thing to do here is to uh, simplify this top piece of the fraction, right? Imagine that this is kind of grouped and we'll simplify with a common denominator. So a nice common denominator would be, so if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to leave the bottom alone. A nice common denominator is going to be x times x plus h. So I need to arrive at that denominator. I will do that by multiplying the first term by x over x and the second term by x plus h over x plus h and distributing correctly. So I'll get x times 1, so I'll get x, and then I'll have minus, because I'm subtracting the second problem, minus, I'll do minus x plus h, uh, all over x, x plus h, all over h. Then, uh, one thing to watch out for is don't get excited and like try to cross out those x plus h's. It doesn't work that way because we have a minus sign there, so just be careful with your algebra. Uh, but what you can do is undo these parentheses, distribute this negative, and we get on the top, we get x minus x minus h, and x minus x reduces with itself. So in the end, then, we end up with minus h over x times x plus h, all over h over 1. We can now convert that to a standard fraction. So it's going to be minus h over x times x plus h times 1 over h, right? Dealing with the complex fraction with a flip, good old flip and multiply. Now those h's are going to reduce out. This is reduces to minus 1. And so we'll get minus 1 over x times x plus h for the simplified difference quotient as our final answer. And so you kind of know, in this one, it might be hard to know when you're done. I would say general advice, you know when you're done, when this final H that started out on the bottom cancels out. If that H is still there, you're not done. You have some work to do. Um, and so this would be the difference quotient for 1 over X, uh, if that comes up and is something you, you see on your, your homework. Now, you may have thought that 1 over x was about as bad as these can get, but there's one last one I wanted to do, and I, I, you may have to deal with this, but I, hopefully you don't have to deal with it too much. A polynomial with a high degree can be really, really annoying to compute the difference quotient for. Uh, so this is going to be f of x uh, is equal to x cubed minus 4x. The graph of it is over here. It's a nice, beautiful cubic um, with zeros at 0, 2, and minus 2. Uh, lovely equation, really nice. Not a good difference quotient. Not a good difference quotient. And here is why. Um, I'm not going to compute this in the fraction yet. I'm just going to compute f of x plus h first. Just going to chunk that part out because uh, it's going to be parentheses x plus h quantity cubed minus 4 parentheses x plus h. And it's not the 4x plus h part I'm worried about. It's this part, because when you have something to the third, it's not, sadly, just x cubed plus h cubed. I wish it was. Life would be a lot easier, but it's not. Instead, what this means is that you have to do x plus h times x plus h times x plus h minus 4 times x plus h. Again, the, the 4 part isn't the hard part. So let's do this out long way. Uh, I know what x plus h squared is. That's going to be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. But then I have to multiply it again, times x plus h. I'm just carrying down the 4 bit. 
then I will distribute this in. So I'll distribute the X's. I'm gonna kind of think about it like distributing the X's across to everything and then distributing the H's across to everything. Uh, and I'll do another line. So distributing the X's across, it'll be X cubed plus 2X squared H plus XH squared. Then I'm going to bring the H's across, and it'll be plus X squared H plus 2XH squared plus uh, H to the third. And all of that minus 4 parentheses X plus H. I think I see some things that that can group, so like terms. So do I have uh, an x squared h's? Yeah, I got a couple x squared h's, and I got a couple xh squareds. So this is going to simplify into x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3h squared x plus h squared. And then I'll do the 4 out, minus 4x minus 4h. Whoa, that's enough, right? And that wasn't even the difference quotient. That was just the f of x plus h part. So now I'm going to take this part that I computed and plug it into the difference quotient formula. f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. All right, so I wrote it out. Uh, I, I did cheat and copy paste because I'm on the computer. Um, so we have that whole monster of an expression uh, that represented f plus f of x plus h, and then I subtracted f of x in green over there, uh, and then I'm dividing by h. And now I'm going to simplify a little bit. So this is going to be like minus x cubed plus 4x. So let's see what cancels out of here. I see that minus 4x and the plus 4x are going to cancel, and I see the x cubed and the minus x cubed are going to cancel. So let me rewrite this. Uh, simplified. 3x squared h plus 3h squared x plus h squared minus 4h all over h. And I feel real h-y because I see a bunch of common terms that are that have that h. So I'll pull that out. almost wrote an x. That's an h. Once you pull that h out, you can simplify it, and you arrive at your final answer for the difference quotient. 3x squared plus 3hx plus h minus 4. And that is the final answer that you have to do, but it gets really complicated. Uh, the answer, the difference quotient itself wasn't even the hard part. The hard part was just computing that x plus h to the third. Um, but this example also illustrates, at least to me, why we like the difference quotient. Remember that the difference quotient was basically a rate of change machine. So say that I was really, really analyzing this graph and I wanted to be able to find average rates of change for a lot of different values and maybe even instantaneous rates of change at all kinds of different values. And I wanted to be able to do that really efficiently. If I was going to have to do this the long way every time, no thank you. But because even though the calculation was long, I can get this simplified difference quotient, I could use this one formula to compute all kinds of slopes, all kinds of, of h's, x's, no matter what. And it would actually be, if I was really getting into detail on this one function, a lot easier. Um, also, can I highlight one thing? This is real side note. In our x plus h cubed, I said, oh man, how irritating is that? Here's x plus h to the third. And I want you to notice that uh, if you've studied any Pascal's triangle, you notice that these are the coefficients from Pascal's triangle, 1, 3, 3, 1. Uh, so Pascal's triangle is the triangle where you go 1, 1, 1, uh, 1, and then you add the numbers 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1. 
if you did remember that, you can definitely use your knowledge of that expansion to avoid doing all of this extra work. So that's one shortcut you can do. Uh, if you end up with an X plus H cubed or, or goodness sakes, an X plus H to the fourth, I would love for you to use all the shortcuts you know when you're doing this. These are not easy. They're not trivial. Uh, they can be pretty tough. All right. That, my friends, is a good place to leave things. Please let me know what questions you have. Good luck on these problems. They are can be difficult. They're new. They're strange. There's a lot of variables. You have to keep track of everything. But I know you can do it. And if you can do it well, it's going to prepare you in a really, really excellent way for calculus when you get there. Thank you all for watching. You've been excellent. I've been Mr. Eck, and I'll see you all next time.